So I'll use this until they change it. Um, we're intentionally not having a break this morning because we don't want to give you an extra excuse to just leave. Um, there's coffee in the back. There's restrooms out this door. So feel free if you need. Um, I'm going to do a summary in just a second. Um, we do. We will have these presentations recorded, as we've already mentioned. Um, so this will be an excellent one to listen to for, for everyone. Um, this Congress has been, I've really enjoyed it. I've enjoyed the presentations I've gone to. I'm looking forward to hearing the recordings of those that I missed. But this has been a great Congress because of you presenting your participation, but the presentations you've given, the volunteer, the thematic presentations, um, those of you who are plenary and keynote. Um, and so um, we've got the first slide here. Um, I've recruited University of Kentucky faculty, graduate students, and our USDA group there um, on campus. Those of you on the research tour met several of them. And I asked them to give a summary, um, a slide or two summary of the thematic sessions. Um, and then I've got a few slides of our um, keynote and plenary. And so I'm going to use the input from those individuals and just go through and, and give you some highlights. And I'm giving you maybe a tenth of the highlights that I could give, but just give you some highlights of what we learned, um, what we saw this week. Uh, maybe even there's a few things that you say, oh, I, I need to go back and make sure when the recordings come out, I listen to that presentation. Good here now? Okay, great. Now, first thing I want to do, because it's been it taken me a minute to figure out how to get to the papers. So just I've got a couple of screenshots. If you download the conference app, it'll take you here. Uh, then click on all sessions. And you'll come up with this list. And it's the first thing when you click on all sessions are the papers. As I've mentioned a couple of times, um, we would have liked to have linked the title of everybody's talk to their paper, but because CVent changed their system a few months ago without kind of letting us know, this is the best that we could do. So click on all sessions, that's listed there. Um, and then, for example, I clicked on the um, grassland production and utilization. Um, there's 112 papers. They're listed as you've... Um, not presented these, but as you sent your paper in, so typically it's by last name. So it'll be a little effort on your part, um, but you can easily go through and um, see papers that were presented. Um, we have the vast majority of papers presented here that are up. Um, the plenary and keynotes, um, most of those individuals um, are going to submit a longer paper into a special issue of Grass and Forge Science um, that'll be coming out in coming months. So at the beginning, we started with our uh, plenary on soil and soil health. Remember, our, our theme is grasslands for soil, animal, and human health. Dr. Burgett talked about harvesting biodiversity for soil health. And these aren't my best slides because these are my screen captures from my phone sitting in the audience. Um, and so, some of the things you won't be able to see really clearly, but listen closely, because I just something that was informative to me as he talked, and he talked about a number of things, excellent presentation. But he talked about sowing mixed plant communities with more diverse root systems, not just the thinking about the above ground growth, but that enhances the resistance to key microbial mediated processes to drought. In essence, improving drought tolerance not by just breeding an improved variety for drought tolerance, but that sowing mixed plant communities. And obviously he went into many more things in this presentation. And he mentioned to me at the end of his presentation how well his presentation um, linked in with Professor He's. Um, and this, this one slide from that presentation, excellent overview of what's happening in the high alpine regions in, in Tibet, in China, I mean, he showed one slide, 
long-term vegetative growth changes here at the, the research station. And notice in that bottom graph, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll read the caption, um, during the, period, the recent period of time with warmer temperatures, they monitored and measured that vegetation grew earlier and faster, uh, which I guess can be useful, but its growth period was compressed. So a difficult situation to deal with. Um, earlier may be nice, but faster growth, compressed growth period, then what do you do with the rest of the growing season? So there's some challenges there. Okay, moving into several of the thematic sessions that happened during the day Monday afternoon. There was one on grassland ecology, um, achieving resilient, sustainable grasslands through the restoration of ecological norms. And a few things that were highlighted in that thematic. Wildlife and soil resources have declined with the conversion of native um, warm season grasslands. Restoring these areas requires the development of strategies of establishing more diverse stands as working lands, not just as a um, national park type setting of, of native grasses. Promoting native warm season grass establishment requires highlighting opportunities for grazing that are profitable for producers. And they went through a number of detailed strategies on how to do that and how to promote that. We had another thematic on alfalfa in warm climate regions. Now, I should add, most of the focus on this was not just warm climate. We know alfalfa grows in warm climates, but the southeastern U.S., warm humid climates, where it's often felt like alfalfa is not going to do that well. So, big challenge in this thematic talked about it was breaking the mindset that alfalfa cannot be grown successfully in warm, humid climates. They talked about the place it has in this region um, for livestock, for cropping. Obviously, we grow a lot for hay production, but not a lot in the southeastern U.S. Producers in the southeast reference greater forage quant um, quality, extending the grazing season, reaching diverse markets as reasons they were optimistic about growing alfalfa. But they went on to talk about the need for partnership between researchers, plant breeders, um, commercial seed companies to produce new varieties adapted to those regions. We had a talk on equine grazing systems. Um, on several of the tours, we highlighted um, Kentucky as a, um, we talked about, you know, world leading area um, for equine and horses. But there's, in, in our experience, even in Kentucky, across the country and I think around the world, there's often an underappreciation of the importance of horses in the landscape. Um, there's, there's about 9 million horses in the U.S. Just in Kentucky, of our 7,000 acres of grassland, about a million of those are grazed by horses. But many of the horse owners have, I, I guess, a lack of appreciation, lack of understanding. They're, they're typically not good agronomists. They're good horse people. So we highlighted several things. Even unique things like from Florida, mixed warm season grass legume pasture. I mean, we think about that as something like fescue or orchard grass, bluegrass, white clover, but they were showing how rhizoma peanut um, can offset the needs for nitrogen fertilizer and can work well in an equine grazing system. Grazing, the microbiome in grazing horses is just beginning to be explored. We know a lot more in cattle um, and understanding the complex relationships between forage nutrients, the hindgut microbiota, and grazing horse metabolism. They highlighted several equine grazing outreach initiatives and rotational grazing research that's happening in that session. Excellent session on social media, understanding social media and digital resources. And this is from one of those presentations talking about integrating research in translating that science so that people could understand. Producers don't want to read manuscripts. Um, in fact, when I'm honest with my graduate students, um, sometimes I have a hard time understanding some of our research manuscripts. Increasing transparency and interaction with producers through social media posts. There's a lot of ways that we can translate the research we're, we're doing, and social media provides a good opportunity for that. And it's not just I mean, my crew from University of Kentucky will, will laugh about how adamant I am about getting everything onto our website, but 
if people can't find it, if they don't, if they don't see it in a timely manner, it doesn't really matter. Social media is a great tool to provide real-time updates of the research and encourage adoption by producers. Dr. Jennifer Tucker from Georgia uh, mentioned the producer there, um, Phil Mosel, who is an alfalfa producer for the last over 50 years, and he has become an advocate for extension information in a regular post influencing other producers. Um, you know, novel idea, like the producers that were in the room today, um, tapping into the expertise of the producers and helping get information out there. There was a thematic session on the NIR, NIRS technology. They highlighted the NIRS Feed and Forage Testing Consortium formed in 1991 to promote and standardize the use of the NIRS. Um, and that group met along concurrently with this meeting. Just a couple of things there, consistency and sample preparation and presentation is essential for optimizing the use of NIRS equations. And, and this consortium is doing a lot with that. Handheld NIRS instruments show great promise for use in developing countries and in, and in developed countries, but significant limitations exist. Um, currently, and many of you have worked with these type units, sample preparation and presentation, poor equations, difficult software interfaces and durability. But if we can get a system that works, at least gives um, close to accurate estimates, that would be very useful. And another thematic was on plantain, a journey from weed to delivering multiple values in farm systems. Plantain is a proven and valuable part of grazed pastures. You get even better benefits from plantain if you're planting the improved varieties that have better biomass growth and, and greater vigor. This former weed reduces nitrogen leaching losses by up to 60% and um, nitrous oxide emissions by up to 50%. Reduced nitrogen concentration in urine patches. Um, root exudates in urine from sheep fed plantain can inhibit nitrification in the soil. Dr. Sarah Place came in Tuesday morning with our um, plenary, again, thematic is grasslands for soil, animal, and human health. And so she was talking about human health. I captured this slide because it, it to me it, it says so much and it puts it in a manner that um, takes a little bit of explaining, but the numbers are, are very informative. The most people, when they're talking about um, well, my pointer is not working on the screen. So most people, when they're, well, people that don't like beef, that want to promote chicken, they talk about how inefficient um, beef production is. In the figures that you see up here on the left-hand column, that's the kind of thing that they use. So pounds of feed per pound of product, live weight. And so the U.S. average grain-finished beef, um, Full life cycle, 13.8 pounds of feed, that includes a fair bit of forage, um, per pound of live weight gain. Broiler chicken, just 1.6, so we all need to just eat chicken. Um, pork is 2.5. Then Sarah converted this, and the publication's at the bottom. You'll probably have to look in the paper to be able to, to read that. Um, pounds of human edible feed per pound of product. So human edible feed, there's a whole bunch of things, but think about corn and soy, which are primary rations fed to uh, livestock, particularly monogastrics, but some fed to cattle as well. Again, with the beef, it's the full cycle of a grain finished beef animal. So 1.6 for that beef animal, 1.4 for chicken. Chicken's still a little bit better. Uh, pork is, is not as good as beef. But then you look at net protein contribution Values greater than one mean more high quality protein generated than used. Beef is 2.66. Um, broiler chicken is 0.86. Um, we think about the protein that you're having to feed to um, poultry and to feed to pork um, to be able to generate the protein. So net protein contribution. Um, way, the ways that we talk about the benefits of ruminant livestock um, you know, things like this can be very helpful. Now, I really appreciated um, Johannes Isselstein with this photograph. And at first I was kind of, he showed a beautiful photograph 
of Lake Lucerne in Switzerland. Um, and, I, and I was trying to get my camera or my phone out to take a picture and I missed it. And so I got the picture of the painting. This really tells a lot more of a story. And he highlighted it in that this is from the early 1800s. So a beautiful scene, um, similar to what you can see today. But the artist made a real point to put cattle, ruminant animals, in the middle of that photo. Obviously, they're essential to maintaining that grassland. Um, obviously, they're, you know, in our minds, essential to just the whole scene. But it was a very deliberate effort 200 years ago to put that into this, this beautiful scene. And so in our messages, as we're talking to people, livestock, and we've heard it over and over, but livestock are essential in maintaining grassland systems. Just one example of some of the data that was shown in that keynote presentation. Here's a long-term grazing experiment, studying the effect of cattle grazing intensity on grassland ecosystem services. And some people would argue that we need no grazing. That's going to be the best maintaining, maintaining the ecosystem. But we saw over and over in, in plenty that cattle are essential to maintaining the open spaces, to maintaining grasslands, to, main, to having carbon sequestration. Then Dr. Um, Paulo Carvalho, he talked about reconnecting grazers to grasslands. And he talked about just one example, a slide here, grazing animals enhance soil health. And he showed how just liming, this is in a system uh, where they were um, a sheep soybean integrated system uh, published in Applied Soil Ecology. So just liming had a number of negative effects in that system um, on the soil um, microbiota and soil life. Grazing had benefits, but if you had Liming, grazing, and fertilization, you had 140% increase in a muscular mycorrhizal fungi. Okay, moving into some of the thematics that we had on Tuesday afternoon. The first one was the role of forged legumes in the Anthropocene um, era. So, legume incorporation. We all know this, um, but it's useful to be reminded. And, and useful as we're thinking about how we talk to other people, how we talk to the public. Increase forage biomass, reduce nitrogen fertilizer and, and NH3 emissions, mitigate uh, methane emissions. Legume response to climate change can vary due to interactions between factors such as elevated carbon dioxide and temperatures. Legume breeders should consider potential epigenic impacts on plant phenotype in response to environmental changes. And again, remember this is a whole thematic session, so just a couple of highlights I'm showing you here. I encourage you to, to listen to that thematic session to look at the papers from it. The good, the bad, and the ugly of secondary metabolites. So let me start at the bottom of this slide because typically we've thought about secondary metabolites, those compounds that aren't essential for plant growth. The, the bad and the ugly that we usually think about, like ergoalkaloids that have profound negative effects on animal growth and performance and lifelong alterations if exposed during gestation. But there's many beneficial secondary metabolites. Um, back up at the top, isoflavones and condensed tannins have, can have significant effects on growth promotion, nitrogen partitioning, methane emissions. Creativity with presentation, we mean how we present it to the animal to consume. And delivery of these compounds to grazing livestock has the potential to create improvements in nutrient density in animal products. Work with the USDA, um, and, and, and this was mainly um, several USDA scientists in Lexington and, and others that put in this presentation. They're showing how the isoflavones in red clover can act as a, do act as a natural antimicrobial providing more efficient use of the nutrients that are grazed. How they can, how they not can, how they do cause vasodilation, and that's an issue in animals on um, fescue and suffering fe fescue toxicosis. They have found how taking um, red clover leaves, in essence taking a bale and removing the stems and having the leaves that are ground and mixing those with mineral, um, even in fairly small proportions, 
um, I can't remember the exact numbers, but mixing in with the mineral for the animal to consume can have many of those same imp um, positive impacts. There was a presentation or a thematic on extending the grazing season. Normally when we think about extending the grazing season, we're thinking about just having that stockpiled forage. Um, we heard from the rancher from Florida talking about stockpiled forage from the wet period into the dry period or from the summer and fall into the winter we think about in this area of the country. But there's a lot of ways to extend the grazing season. They learned long ago in the northern Great Plains of the U.S. and up into Canada that swath grazing, growing a crop late in the year, swathing it, leaving it laying in the field was a great way to have material there and that works well in cold climates where it's just kind of um, there preserved by the cold weather over the winter. Works great, as I said, in cooler semi-arid reasons or less precipitation. Great nutrient cycling, something that I never really thought about until a few years ago because producers always say, well, I feed here, I put my manure back on the field. But the vast majority of the potassium coming out of the animal is coming out in the urine. Um, so that's not going to work if you're feeding in one area. So the swath grazing is a way to distribute that um, in, a, in a winter feeding type system. Bale grazing is another way to do that. Bales placed in the field in the fall and then, in essence, rotationally grazed through the winter. So using electric fence and grazing those periodically does cause some damage in that area around the bale, but it's a great way to stretch grazing through the winter using that stored feed, putting, as we have here, um, a way to increase soil fertility in, in fields that, that need it. Alternative forages like brassica is a great way to give um, improved quality. We had a presentation on diverse perennial circular systems. Now, when I read this thematic, I was like, uh, what do they mean by that? But their definition is this is really just a good balanced forage system. It's another way to word it. Um, you look at, you think about pastures and forage mixtures adding in crop rotations with forages, living mulches. So how we communicate what we do every day um, as relevant to, to policymakers, to the general public, um, we get very frustrated, I know, it in, in group, the University of Kentucky, with cover crops, cover crops. And we say, well, they're all forages. Uh, but we can't just be frustrated about it. We have to think about ways that we're able to communicate that the whole system and the whole benefit of the system, particularly of how ruminant livestock fit into that system. There was a whole theme, thematic session on variety testing. And it focused more on variety testing in the southeastern United States. And the region is getting warmer and wetter. And so an emphasis on the importance of being able to select resilient varieties that require both yield and persistence um, so that's important. So we need to have data from variety testing with grazing tolerance. Developing accelerated stand loss, proto stand loss protocols may be needed to enhance varietal separation because we typically can't do variety tests for 10 years. So we may need ways of, or we do need ways of more intense grazing periods to accelerate stand loss. Variety testing working groups should be formed in the southeastern US and we'll have to be creative with this. So we, um, Kentucky would be included in the southeastern U.S. and the public funding for variety testing um, has diminished, has greatly diminished. And so this is probably really talking about a partnership between industry and university and, and maybe other funding organizations. A presentation that I actually only got to a little bit of, I'm looking forward to listening, was Clovers Around the World, Professor Norm Taylor Memorial Symposia. I was fortunate to overlap with Dr. Taylor from my time, beginning time at University of Kentucky. He continued coming into work. Uh, well, he retired, but he continued coming in about 15 years after he retired until about three months before he passed away and he was 86. He was a clover breeder um, for about 60 years. He devoted his life to the collection of clover genetic resources, to clover science, to clover genetic improvement. In fact, the World of Clovers, I think, is the name of the book that he wrote on this subject with, with other co-authors. Papers cover the full range of clover genetic resources. Red clover rhizobial um, genetics. Red, white, annual clover breeding updates. And the future of clovers for forage systems and as cover crops. 
Dr. Taylor played around with crimson clover back in the 60s and 70s and made some collections for more winter hardy um, crimson clover. But then he just put it on the shelf. Um, it didn't seem that anybody really cared about it. Nobody cared about crimson clover in this region in um, Kentucky and Indiana and Ohio. And in fact, it was soon before he died and then after he died that we took that off the shelf. We put it into testing and it's very useful to have an annual clover, very productive clover, very high nitrogen fixation clover in cropping systems, cover crop systems and forage systems. And we were able to bring that out. Soil health and carbon sequestration was another thematic session. We all know that grasslands are a major source of the carbon that's sequestered in soil. Proper management and maximizing all five soil health principles is going to lead to increased carbon sequestration. Carbon credits, that's talked about a lot. The problem is so many people want to think about it. How do we measure it? The change happening in a year or two. And we've got to think about it in decade long things and let policymakers know that. But fortunately, pasture setting of just three years integrated into a cropping system can result in positive carbon sequestration. But there's a need for more research on methods to sequester carbon, particularly in subtropical regions. Then we moved into um, another plenary. Um, Friedrich Lois gave an excellent presentation. Um, I need to, again, look back at the recording because there was so much detail in this presentation. So I just want to highlight a couple of things. And he talked about over on the left, animal source foods are keystone foods for nutrient security. I mean, it's, it's great to talk about um, we don't need meat and, you know, the public talks about that and it's a lot better to use plant source. But we, it's much easier to use animal source foods for human nutrition. And he's done an excellent job in this presentation and in his research and in his career in, in showing that. We need to get our public health priorities right. Metabolic syndrome, we talk about it a lot in um, generic um, geriatric horses. Um, metabolic syndrome is a problem in people. And convincing the public that animal source protein is a solution, not a problem. Now, I loved what Amy talked about when she talked about grasslands at a crossroads. And this is a paper from Science. And I mean, I can read this paper and understand it. And I think most of the public, with a little bit of explanation, can understand some of the key themes of the paper. I mean, it's a scientific paper. There's a whole lot of details. But they put together this little schematic in, in showing things like grazing and ecosystem service delivery in global dry lands. Grazing sustains the livelihood of billions of people particularly in the dry lands. Um, Amy made the comment, and she is the um, overall head of the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, which is the main granting agency of USDA for agricultural work, that maybe, maybe they'll start requiring schematics like this in our reports and in papers that we publish, and probably a good idea. Now, I'll have to hire someone or get a grad student that's a little better artist than I am for me to implement that. Dana Kelly was the last of our keynotes uh, and talked about social challenges in the grassland and gave a number of examples and some great case studies. One of the things she mentioned was gender equality. Worldwide, half of farmers are women, varies between countries obviously, but 40% of the world's countries have constraints on women's rights to own property. So here's an area where we can talk about the best production methods and the need to, to use these production methods. But if we're, if we're not encouraging everyone and making an equal playing field for everyone, then there, there's problems, there's issues. Several more thematics let me go through in the next couple of minutes. There was an excellent thematic yesterday afternoon preparing the next generation of grassland scientists. Dr. Sullenberger talked about the value of mentorship posit and, and, and documented the positive association with productivity and career achievement through students that had um, proactive and positive mentors. High quality mentor-student relationship leads to continued success of the students. He encouraged students to carefully choose your mentor. 
build development plans. So this is talking to the actual, you know, the professor, the industry leader. Make a deliberate effort to build development plans for individuals by identifying strengths and weaknesses and, and how to help and encourage them. Challenges though, effective training requires a broader training and awareness of the best management practices of mentorship. And in this thematic, they went on to talk about how mentoring and how preparing the next generation fits into industry, leaders that we're training, fits into extension, um, fits into all areas. Um, excellent thematic. The thematic then on livestock production systems, revisiting the nutritive value of forages to the animal, to the farm, to the agroecosystem. So talked about proper determination and interpretation of forage nutritive value is essential for this optimizing the stability and the function of microorganisms in the rumen and animal performance. In the thematic, they talked about pasturing replacement dairy heifers versus confinement may have short and long-term benefits, performance, health, and economics, and talked about development approaches. Another thematic was enhancing grasslands through weed and brush management. And, and some documentation was shown for with proper management of weed and brush can increase bi um, biomass productivity and livestock carrying capacity, increase livestock production, toxic plant management, and grassland system resiliency. But they emphasize it's not just a thing of we need to spray more, we need to use more herbicides, but weed and brush management should include integrative strategies. Fortunately, there's new precision technologies, including drones and artificial intelligence for spot spraying that will, that is and will improve the efficiency of weed control. We had a thematic on restoring ecological function. In this thematic, they talked about native grasslands or diverse ecosystems on which many species depend. These annuals compete with native perennials. So we need those native grasslands, but a, a big theme of this was how um, annuals and, and weedy annuals compete with those native perennials and, and have all kinds of problems. So they gave an example of, um, in, in this thematic, of pre-emergent herbicides have been shown to be most effective controlling those species that are competitive. This is particularly relevant in the western U.S., but even increasingly in the eastern U.S. and other parts of the world. Areas where invasive annuals have been successfully controlled saw an increase in wildlife, pollinators, and plant biodiversity. But since reestablishment is exceedingly difficult once the area has been taken over by these um, invasive annuals, emphasis should be placed on proactively um, or being proactive in minimally affected areas first, then spreading the efforts to more degraded areas. Now, there's a hundreds are um, way over 100 oral volunteer presentations, number of posters, so to not leave you out, I've added one of those in. And this was an interesting talk. Um, Christian talked about, addressed, he addressed grazing personalities associated with cattle in the steep, rugged rangelands of southern New Zealand. Um, the, the team used GPS trackers and genotyping for the grazing gene GRM5 Researchers were able to categorize animals into short range, medium range, and long, -term, long range grazers. It was proposed that this, uh, that this be used as a selection tool. If the cattle that ranged the furthest, the, those long range cattle were selected for, um, for predominantly in the herd, then there would be more efficient use of available forage in a paddock. I never thought about something like this. And we heard over and over from your presentation, your volunteer presentation, from your thematic, from the keynotes, um, new ideas, new ways to think about things. And so I just encourage us all to take some time to look at the proceedings papers. Take some time um, when our final proceedings come out to, to share those with others um, and take some time to listen to the recorded presentations. Now, I ran out of time to have this nice conclusion slide, but then I realized that our, our tours that we had on Wednesday. I in, enjoyed participating and helping lead. I think we all enjoyed getting out. Uh, we were very fortunate with a, a beautiful day. So the conclusion was the fellowship and the interaction and the collaboration that we've developed. Let's keep that up. Let's continue that. So thank you all for all that you've had in making this a successful Congress.
So Derek Woodfield, the chair of the IGC Continuing Committee, is going to lead us in our business meeting. And then we have a, an exciting and interesting closing ceremony following up on that. So hang with us for just a little longer. Um, I really like that last slide about the long distance grazers. You all fall into that category because you're probably as far from home as you can get, a lot of you, so you're a good selection. Um, the, the business meeting, if you are worried about flights, etc., will finish at 11 so we can have the conference, or by 11 so we can have the uh, closing session. Um, but I suppose the key thing about this is to talk about uh, firstly, the new committee that uh, have been nominated for uh, to continue beyond this point, and then uh, a few key uh, relevant points that have come up came up during the business meeting on Monday, and also resolutions that have been raised by by this group. There we go. The uh, agenda and uh, the first item there really is the uh, nominations of the continuing committee. Struggling to move this on. Is there a reason, Ray? Pointers working? All right, can you move to the next slide for me, please? This one? Okay, thank you. So I'll start with the, at the moment, the three names up there are the people who are elected, that were elected at uh, the 2015 uh, Congress in India, and they serve for two terms, um, uh, two between two congresses, but because Kentucky, so, sorry, because Kenya was a virtual congress, we couldn't actually elect people. So the, the uh, their terms got extended through until uh, the next congress, which for these uh, this group of people will be 2027. Um, and the new chair of the continuing committee comes from those who are who are continuing to 2027. So they've served a term, got some knowledge. And so uh, I want to congratulate uh, Dr. Fernando Ortega on agreeing to serve as the incoming chair of the continuing committee. Next, there are a group of people that were meant to continue through to 2027, but because life happens, um, have been unable to do that. Um, Dr. Sirkan Atez, uh, who was in Jordan when he was elected, is now living in the United States and felt uh, he needed somebody really who's in the region to represent that more fairly. And Dr. Munir Lehaichi uh, from Tunisia has agreed to replace him through to, and they will complete the term to 2027. Uh, we are still uh, discussing, there was nobody from that Middle East uh, region here, and we are in discussion with, uh, with two candidates at the moment uh, to fill that role, so that will be uh, processed post-Congress. Uh, post and then those nominated uh, from here, and which uh, we would like you to endorse, um, are for, the, sorry, the other thing you should know is that we don't, um, when, when it changes at the end of your term, uh, it moves to another country. The representative comes from a different country in that region so that we keep moving uh, that around. And uh, in this case, uh, Ray Smith has served for the USA for the last 10 years. Uh, and for instance, I served for Oceania for the last 10 years. So we have moved, the, the next representative comes from Canada and Assistant Professor Glazy Silver has accepted a nomination uh, to uh, uh, act for this region. Uh, Dr. Luis, Luis uh, Villalobos from uh, Costa Rica has agreed to represent Central America. Uh, Dr. Mahindra Singh Pal has, uh, has agreed to represent 
uh, uh, in, uh, with Southeast Asian region. Um, Dr. Lindsay Bell has agreed to, uh, we've transitioned that to Australia, obviously from New Zealand, to represent Oceania. And the amazing Dr. Bridget Lynch uh, from Chagask and Ireland uh, will, uh, has been nominated to, uh, to represent Ireland. So, um, in addition to that, uh, we appoint from the, the local organising committee from the USA, IGC, also nominates a representative to uh, who's on the committee uh, as a non-voting member through to the next Congress, and that's again to try and help uh, uh, transition the knowledge of how to organise one of these and work alongside uh, the 2027 IGC uh, organising committee. Uh, so if your name is on that list and you are here, can you please stand? Jason. If there are no uh, other nominations, uh, then I will declare that that is the IGC continuing committee through to uh, in part 2027 and another part to 2031. So then, um, Ray, can you just come up quickly and let people know about the IGC Past Proceedings Project and the IGC Archives? You thought you were finished uh, before the closing, but... My wife Stephanie, when I sat down, I said, I'm finished. And she said, no, your name is on the agenda. <laughs> but um, two of the things that I'm, I'm really um, thankful for, for these initiatives started by the continuing committee over the last number of years that, that are coming to fruition. Um, one that we're still working on is a, developing archives of the materials and the information and photos, et cetera, um, from past IGCs into an archive. The chief archivist for the University of Kentucky um, was here actually on Sunday. Uh, I highlighted the work that she's done in, in helping us put this together. Now, in the, we, we don't have that formal archives that you can go to right now, but we have taken several things from that and put into the, um, the IGC website, so internationalgrasslands.org. You can go there now. When we have the um, history part and the about, we give some of the early history and some of the photos that you can go and look at. The proceedings project, um, I'm not sure when it went back to, but sometime after India and the continuing committee and, and past chairs of the continuing committee, there was this concern that, I mean, we have proceedings, they're available in libraries, um, but often how you have to, if you want a proceedings paper, if you, if you find this topic and you're trying to find that paper, you're maybe calling me up and I'm going to the cabinet and I'm photocopying it and I'm scanning it and sending it to you and that's a bit of a um, cumbersome way and, and not a very a real effective way of getting it out there. And I, I don't remember exactly how it happened. I was talking to a group at the University of Kentucky Libraries and they have this system, they call it UK Knowledge, so no offense to those in the United Kingdom, um, University of Kentucky, United Kingdom, um, but where they'll um, catalog proceedings and other other documents, some of our extension publications, etc. And the way they do that is, for example, with our proceedings. So going back to Brazil, we have these online now in a downloadable, searchable fashion. Every single paper is put up as a separate entry with, with keywords for that paper. So you can, if you presented, if you've presented a paper at past congresses, Type in your name and if, in a few keywords, and you'll probably pull that paper up from the proceedings. You can also, when that paper pulls up, you can see the number of downloads. We've had over 170,000 downloads of, of papers, and this is, project has just been ongoing for a little over two years. So our goal is to have all the proceedings in this searchable, readily available format and going back to 1927. Now, the Chief person leading this, um, Kyle Bachman Johnson, uh, asked her, is it really realistic for us to go back to 1927? And she cringed a little bit. So we're going to go as far as we can. 
my, my goal is you're going to be able to announce in 2027 we have them all the way back. But we'll get as far as we can. Um, and they said with some additional funding that we'll work on um, that that can happen. And so your papers from this meeting will be loaded onto that site. Now, again, it'll probably be two or three months before those will be up. But your papers that you presented here won't just go into this big PDF that we will make available to you, the proceedings, our printed book. They'll be available for everyone to download. So I'm excited about that. Thanks, Derek. Thank you, Ray. Um, sorry, there's just, uh, I forgot two things on the, on the nomination committee. Um, firstly, I, I missed out the uh, Northern Eurasia one, um, where uh, I had quite a considerable help to find uh, Dr. Lena Serrante um, from, uh, from Lithuania to fill that role. And thank you very much, Peter, for your help uh, in finding someone from your region. Peter was the, the only, or Peter and his wife were the only people here. Peter has already served uh, eight years on the continuing committee in the past, so it felt uh, harsh to try and make him do it again. Um, and also special thanks to Gavin Sheath, who uh, did a power of work in the background to help uh, find uh, find some of the people who uh, uh, have been nominated. So thank you, Gavin. Um, the, also, the other thing that we'd just like to announce is that to try and get better continuity between congresses and to keep in contact with people and um, drive some of the new initiatives in assisting the IGC Continuing Committee, we are trialling a permanent uh, uh, IGC secretariat. And so... Uh, Tina Bowling, who has uh, done so much work for this Congress um, and who offers her services to uh, a range of other non-profit organisations. Uh, we have a two-year contract to see how that works. To make it work long term, we will need to find a sponsor that would, um, would see that as something that they could sponsor between Congresses, and so we'll be talking to our sponsors about that. We've certainly got enough funds, and we've looked at our, our reserve funds that we are um, funding this initiative out of and um, feel it's worth it, so that's um, what we've done. But going forward, uh, we, we will definitely look for a sponsor to help us with that. Lastly on, on this list, obviously there's, there, you, if you've been downstairs and seen the booth you will know that the 26th International Grassland Congress is going to be in Leipzig, Germany. And I won't say any more about that here because uh, in the closing ceremony there will be a full presentation from them that you can uh, enjoy and take notes on. Um, but I do want to take the opportunity to um, to mention to you that if you are interested in um, pulling together uh, a bid to, um, to host the 2031 or around there, 2030, 2032, somewhere in that range, if you are interested um, in hosting that, come and talk to us. Um, we have talked to a, to a couple of groups, um, uh, one from uh, from South America and another from New Zealand. Um, those are not, they, nothing happens until they go through their local grassland uh, organisations and agree that they have got a community of support to do that and then there is a formal bid process that's prepared and submitted. Um, but certainly uh, if you think that your region uh, has the, the um, level of support and interest to host one of these, um, contact uh, uh, myself or Fernando Ortega as the incoming continuing committee chair or come through the IGC uh, secretariat. Um, that's the process. Now we get to the uh, fun part which is the uh, resolutions, oh, sorry, are there, is there any questions anyone would like to ask on that? Um, we get to the fun part, which is the IGC resolutions, and I'll ask uh, Dr. Fernando Ortega to come up and, uh, and assist with these. Um, the uh, committee that uh, pulled these resolutions together was uh, Dr. Ortega, uh, Dr. Zhang Kong Lee from South Korea, and Dr. Sirkan Atez.
Okay, so good morning. So the first resolution stands that the members of the 25th International Class and Con Congress congratulate the U.S. Or Organizers Committee for their efforts in putting together an excellent Congress. The Congress plenary sessions were informative and the volunteer oral and poster presentations provided an excellent overview of grasslands around the world. Also, the thematic sessions were a perfect complement. So please give an applause. Basically, you do get to vote on these, but a round of applause says that you all agree with them, all right? So the second resolution is that we want to thank the sponsoring organisations uh, for their financial and in-kind support uh, for this 25th IGC. Um, we particularly we, we acknowledge the uh, uh, should read it properly. Um, particularly given the global financial situation post-COVID, uh, sponsorship is a critical component in minimising registration costs and. Certainly um, one of the factors in this Congress was uh, that we, we certainly saw a drop in overall sponsorship over what we expected. That meant that we were unable to offer as many um, uh, sponsorship packages to bring uh, people from, uh, from smaller countries where those, they need that support to be able to get here. And um, what the... Uh, the the um, USA organising committee had allocated half of ev of all sponsorship was to go to support delegates from those countries, and so the more sponsorship we get, the more delegates we could support. Um, and so uh, this is an acknowledgement that that we did get support, uh, and we appreciate that greatly. But equally, um, we need to continue to uh, to drive for more. Uh, sponsorship support in the future. So let's move to the third resolution that the 26th IGC organizing committee make every reasonable effort to enable participants from as many countries as possible to attend the keeping cost low including range of accommodations, providing delegate sponsorship, supporting early career researchers attending the Congress, and make every effort to promote the Congress internationally. Okay. So obviously that, that's a little bit binding on the, on the next organizing committee. Um, but you know those discussions were held also as part of of the bid process. Um, so in their document, uh, you know that aligns well with the with the document that we accepted as an IGC con continuing committee around trying to encourage wider participation. Um, as part of that, um, we have also uh, uh, a resolution that 20 euros per attendee earned during the 2026, uh, during the 26th um, IGC should be provided to the IGC Continuing Committee as start-up uh, funds for uh, the next Congress and to support Continuing Committee activities between Congresses. And so in, in speaking to that, it, it, for this one it was $10 US. We can see that there are more activities that need to happen, and also um, at least half of the regions from which we get delegates, it is sometimes quite hard for those continuing committee members to be able to even come to this Congress. Um, and so we are cognizant of that in trying to just uh, increase that levy a little bit. It doesn't provide a huge amount of funding, but it, it, it is uh, hopefully sufficient to allow the IGC continuing committee to support the next Congress beyond, uh, even beyond 2027 and the delegates to go to the next one. Oops. Push 
So resolution number five, the continuing committee should uh, commission a study on the global future of grasslands and present, and present this at the 100th anniversary of the IGC in 2027. The study would involve all relevant stakeholders. This resolution comes from the, from the last Congress, yes. I understand, so uh, we need to work on it. I suppose a uh, comment on this one is that we probably, we have 11 regions. We are looking for uh, a, a probably two key authors from each of those regions who would contribute to a, um, a forward-looking study of the future of, of, um, of global grasslands, particularly for their region. Uh, the aim would be for this to potentially be um, a separate uh, publication um, that looks right across those regions. So um, each of the continuing committee members will be looking uh, for for at least two people, uh, maybe more from their region, to act as a um, a contact point or as a coordinating point to pull that information together. Equally, if you can, if you are here and go, gee, I'd really like to contribute to that, then um, re refer to the back to your regional representative and and put your hand up to say that you would like to contribute to that effort. So if you all agree with that resolution, I'd ask you to indicate your support. Uh, the sixth uh, resolution, which um, Jim should, uh, should, should resonate well with you, is that uh, the International Grasslands Congress fully support the International Year of Rangelands and Pastoralists initiative for 2026, including encouraging, and probably should say active participation in the regional support groups. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll move the uh, addition of the word active there to that resolution. Um, uh, but I think uh, you know, we've heard a number of times throughout this, this Congress that this initiative gives not just um, the rangeland and pastoralists, but actually the whole grassland community, the chance to uh, have an influence uh, far beyond our, the, the regular communities with whom we communicate. And that um, this is a chance uh, to actually get a broader exposure across an entire year um, for the importance of our national grasslands and rangelands. Um, and their their vital part in the future of our planet, and um, so again, if you are in a region, um, you, I think all those committees, regional committees, are on your website, uh, aren't they, um, Jim? So if you go to the International Rangelands uh, website, you can actually see where you can uh, join one of those initiatives, and so I'd strongly encourage you to do so. So you can read this one, and then Pat Garden, who proposed it, are you here? I'll get you to just uh, come forward and, and make a couple of supporting comments, even though it's probably, again, self-evident, but if you could do that, so you read it. Okay. Um, I think that this one was proposed by somebody. It's by Pat, but that's all right. Just yes. You, you read it, and he'll come and speak. So resolution number seven that the International Grassland uh, Congress Continuing Committee consider bringing IGC and International Relations Co Congress closer together given the many topics th that, the, that are common to both groups. And it's good to have a grassland uh, farmer uh, speak to this resolution. Thanks, Derek. I don't get too hung up about labels, and it doesn't matter to me whether it's a, a ranger, a pastoralist, or a farmer, nor do I get uh, too worried about um, what they're working with, um, whether it's rangeland, or hill country, or grassland. 
Uh, for me, the critical components are pasture and livestock. So um, I would very much like to see a much closer relationship between the IGC and the IRC. I've been to, this is my third Congress, one in Hohot, the second in Sydney, uh, now here uh, in Kentucky, and I'm very keen to go to Adelaide, and God willing, I'll be um, accompanying folk to Leipzig. So um, I really would like to see um, that relationship look at continuing sharing of um, uh, the Congress, but ultimately, for me, it would be the one organisation. And I know there's been um, some uh, discussion about that um, over time, and perhaps we cling to uh, our sort of traditional groups, but uh, for me, it's one family, and I would like to see them come together. So I think this is one that we ha that uh, IRC will go to the IRC committee. And they will acknowledge that uh, this resolution has been made here, and they will discuss it. And certainly the IGC continuing committee uh, will discuss this. And um, there is reasonably regular communication with the two, particularly around the potential for uh, future uh, joint congresses. Um, so uh, I will get you to come and speak to this, Gavin, if you don't mind. Um, but the resolution is that the incoming IGC Continuing Committee reviews the existing constitution relating to the nomination and appointment of Continuing Committee members in order to strengthen regional representation and contributions to IGC affairs. The uh, current constitution that IGC operates to is probably written about 50 years ago and uh, things I suppose evolve and change and um, there's two items that I think that the upcoming uh, committee can think about. One is the actual regions themselves, as Derek said there's 11, uh, with geopolitical kind of changes that go on, are those 11 that were set up about 50 years ago most appropriate in representing the actual interests? Uh, the second is that in terms of seeking people to contribute through continuing committee activities, the current constitution states that the people that actually go on to the committee need to be at the con such as we've been and at times that's particularly difficult and I think we've picked that up at this particular meeting where uh, representation from some countries has been very or regions have been quite small uh, and uh, the opportunity for instance to be seeking nominations and participation through a slightly different process, which may be nominations before the Congress. Uh, do we need people to actually be at the Congress uh, to go on to the committee to take up uh, future roles? So it's simply asking that those types of uh, issues uh, possibly deal, uh, dealt with to get the right representation and to get uh, uh, an active participation on the uh, continuing committee. So um, I will open the floor to anybody if, if there are any additional comments or questions that people have on that resolution, because it, it will require a constitutional change at the, the next IGC. But are, are there any comments or questions? There are not, so I'll ask to put that to the vote by a, a show of round of applause. Um, the last one, and Peter, you can get ready to speak to this. Um, the last is uh, the, the 26th IGC Organising Committee, Jürgen, uh, consider including 
human nutrition and metabolic health topics in their program, and in preparation, make connections with appropriate scientific and professional groups. And Peter also added to the original one, there was a list of about eight different organisations um, that I didn't clutter the slide with, but they're both global and regional uh, organisations. Peter. Thank you. I suggest this as continuing the theme, one of the themes of this Congress, as well as what Dr. Kelly pointed out, the trend over years of emphasizing the human element um, and our role in human flourishing worldwide. Um, so I just think that this would be a good follow-on to what we were exposed to at this Congress. And in the course of what I've done in building bridges over the years, I've been introduced to these scientific and clinical organizations, and I would be more than happy to help make those introductions so that the, the, the committee for the 26th uh, International Congress could consider that for there, uh, as well as perhaps some educational efforts between now and then um, to communicate this information among the membership. So that's uh, my intent, and I guess that's enough. Yeah, so thank you thank very much. You very much. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. It's, it is really helpful when the people who actually submit um, resolutions actually can speak to them. So, um, Jürgen, I suppose this is a one that goes back to your committee to consider. Um, so, uh, so I appreciate that. Uh, so all those in favour, uh, show your, uh, if you agree. So thank you, Fernando. Um, so that is the end of the resolutions piece. So this is where I call for any other business from the floor. Does anyone have a topic, a hot topic that they've been thinking about during this business meeting that they would uh, like discussed? Then for the minutes, there were no other um, there were no other items brought up under other business, and we can close this uh, this uh, IGC business meeting, Ray, and uh, you can decide whether you're going to pause for ten minutes before the closing or whether you're going to start a little early. Thank you all. So again, as I mentioned earlier, um, we'll have on your own breaks. If you need some coffee or, or something else, um, please feel free, but we're not going to take a, a formal break. I um, definitely want to thank Derek for serving as the chair of the Continue Committee um, since the time in, since the Congress that we had in Kenya, providing a lot of leadership. Um, with these resolutions, these are things that we're you know, we, we're not requiring, but these are things that people have resolved and, and given given those resolutions that encourage us to move forward. And, and we want to be active in that. Feel free to, as a delegate, if you're kind of wondering what's the progress, um, to ask us. On the website, we have the continuing committee members um, from each region. We'll continue to have our info at internationalgrasslands.org. Um, so, you know, be in touch, be in contact. I'm um, talking to Tina, one of the efforts that we want to try to do um, in her role as the secretariat is give some information to you. You're, you're now, you've attended this meeting, you've registered, you're an official delegate, just to give you informational things, not just, not just things in the 2027 meeting, um, but on other efforts as well. So our closing ceremony, we don't have a lot of pomp and circumstance, but we have two very exciting and interesting things that are going to be presented. The first is going to be a presentation on the history of the IGC, and then we will go into the future of the IGC with the kickoff of IGC 2027. So I'm going to ask um, Vivian Allen, who is the lead author of the history of IGC, to uh, come up and, um, Gary, are you coming up now or just 
Gary Lacefield is another author of the IGC history. So they're going to give a, a, an informative and interesting um, overview of the history. Ladies and gentlemen, last night when we surprised Vivian, we, she wasn't sure exactly what was going on. She has been working on the International Grassland Congress history, as I indicated, for over six years. And what she wants, we're going to do now is give a, a slide presentation, a brief overview, and then keeping in, in sync with what the producers talked about this morning, about telling the story. Uh, there's going to be some people from the past sharing their story, and that's our message today. So it's my pleasure, and welcome me, welcome Dr. Vivian Allen to the stage. Thank you, Gary. I appreciate that. And before you go anywhere, I just want to be sure that you all know that the authors of that book are Ray Smith, Gary Lacefield, Roger Wilkins from the UK, who unfortunately cannot be with us, and I did that together. It's a collaborative effort. So. Uh, we, we did a lot of work over a lot of years, and I want to thank these co-authors publicly right now. <laughs> the International Grasslands Congress is a compelling story. Uh, it goes back, if I can go back, I go forward. <laughs> Gary? <laughs> there we go. Any discussion of the history of the International Grasslands Congress must contain in it the contributions of Ross Humphreys. Ross kept our history alive through a lot of years and a lot of time when nobody was paying much attention to the history. They were looking forward and they wanted to uh, record that history. Ross kept notes. He published four publications. The last one is that the uh, Congress in Ireland in 2005, and that is in the proceedings from that Congress. And without his contributions, we would not have found a lot of the basic numbers and graphs and things that, that he contributed. And so I honor him, I congratulate him, and I thank him for his contribution. Ray Smith is the one that started this, this travel, this tale, this story. Uh, at the 2013 Congress in Australia, he was elected to the Continuing Committee. He was also, in 2015, elected Chair of the Continuing Committee. And that continued until through Kenya. And he was to serve as Chair through Kenya. Well, he started thinking about what he wanted to do for the Kenya meetings that could be something of great interest. And so it was a joint meeting with the IRC. So they came up with, uh, well, let's do an update on the history of both these organizations. And uh, so that was started. And so he contacted Gary and me. And he asked us if uh, we would work together. We've always worked together, Gary. <laughs> we'd work together to update the history. Well, we had Ross's contribution from 2005. So uh, Gary and I talked about it, and we decided we'd better check with Ray and just see exactly what he had in mind. Did he want an abstract added? Did he want us to update his graphs and, and uh, tables and things and just bring it up to date a little bit? Was there a word limit? Was it, were we going to have a paragraph or a page or maybe five pages? And so uh, we talked to Ray. And Ray said, well, I'm not thinking about particularly limits. Let's just see what we can find and see what we can do. So we started looking. And four years and 300 pages later, we had a book. It was an incredible journey. It took us everywhere in the world. It put us in touch with people I never dreamed I would be in touch with. And we found information that we didn't realize we could find. We did not find it quickly. And one of the problems that Gary and I had, we met in his house in Kentucky, where uh, Cheryl served us some coffee. And we talked about this. And we started thinking about where to look for information. And very quickly, we realized that we couldn't find much information other than Ross Humphrey's contributions. So we worked together to try to find more information 
and did find finally that, uh, that, that skipped one. Well, it has skipped one for some reason. Anyway, what I was going to tell you was that we, we got as far as an outline. You know, you, you always have to do this outline first so you know where you're going. And we were putting out topics that we thought we ought to address. And the constitution of our organization was one of them. So Gary and I both knew Roger Wilkins from the UK. We both knew that he'd been very involved with the Constitution. And we also knew that uh, he had done a lot of writing about that, so we thought we'd better talk to Roger. So we called, sent him an email and told Roger what we were doing and asked him if he would be willing to help us with the constitutional part because we knew he was the world expert on that. And he sent us back a message that said he would very much like to do that. And then he ended saying, he, was, he says, I think you can tell I'm actually really quite excited about this. Well, if Roger was excited, Gary and I were ecstatic because we knew Roger would be an enormous source of information. What we didn't realize at that point, just how much information Roger would bring. Roger had contacts through Europe and uh, beyond. He had access to libraries that did have copies of older uh, proceedings. and it just began to flow from there. So among the four of us that worked on this, we finally ended up, we, we did have contacts that really spanned the globe, and we were able to bring in quite a lot of information, and it became quite a story. And of course, if you've read any of the book, you know that these four men were the founders of this uh, organization. They had been meeting together and talking together, and they would visit each other and look at the research that they were doing, and they tested some uh, different uh, scientific equipment and pasture measurements and things together. And they began to realize how valuable that was to get together and share this information. And so they had some feet relays or some uh, meetings that they would bring others to, but it needed to go beyond that. So Friedrich Falke was able to get the first meeting going, and they called it a meeting. They didn't call it a congress. And they decided that it would be there in Leipzig in, 19, in 1927. And the reasons that he gave to the, the people that came to that first meeting was that the purpose was to exchange knowledge, exchange experience, to look at forage research firsthand. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is where these tours started that we've had every Congress since then. They knew the value of getting out there and seeing these things firsthand that you cannot get from just talking about it. They were concerned with food security. They had been through the First World War. They knew that food security meant national security, and they knew what it meant uh, to not have what you need to eat. They were especially uh, concerned with the grasslands. And grasslands agriculture at that point in time was not keeping up with other forms of agriculture, and they were worried. There was a palpable sense of urgency in what they wrote in these early writings that they left us. The second meeting went to Sweden. He was also one of the founders. He had pioneered work in pasture improvement and marginal lands, particularly where the pastures transitioned into the woodlands in Sweden. And he had done this before the uh, First World War. His work contributed to, to feeding people and to keeping them on the land during that war. It fed people that would have had, had to leave where they were and might have starved to death had he not done what he did. And it, it involved the pasture lands, the grasslands. The Fourth Congress went to Wales. and. Uh, Stapleton uh, was the one that was in charge of that meeting. He was already known all over the world for his work in legume and grass breeding and, and uh, pasture work. And he recognized the strategic importance of grassland. Strategic importance of grassland. Food security, national security. He, because of the research that he did, leading up to the Second World War, fed people that would have starved to death. He did research that the economists and other researchers told him he was wasting his time doing because he was working with marginal lands and showing how you could restore them. 
by inclusion of grasslands in a rotation with crops that could feed people. They didn't think he was contributing much at that point, but at the end of the war, the Minister of Agriculture stated, without the achievements of Stapleton, Britain would have starved and would not have been capable of mounting any military challenge. Profound words. The grasslands played an incredible role. The sixth country was the first to come to the United States. Uh, Philip Cardin was with the USDA in Beltsville, Maryland. He uh, led a delegation to the Congress that was led by Stapleton, and that was the first time that had happened. So he invited the Congress to come to the U.S. They came to Pennsylvania, and in his talk, if you read his talk, he entitles part of it, Peace in the Grasslands. They had just come through the Second World War. Peace and war were very much in the thinking of the day. And he said, we seek to promote the security of nations, their economic stability, and the welfare of all their people. But our approach is the grass route, not with weapons of war, but peace through the grasslands. The Seventh Congress went to New Zealand, and that was the furthest away they had been. And we heard that uh, uh, Bruce Levy there gave his talk to the delegates and he made the statement, grasslands stand twixt a world of plenty and a world of famine. The next uh, Congress that we'll talk about was uh, 1965, when Sao Paulo, Brazil, the first time they had been to Brazil. And uh, Hugo Lem stated that the greatest enemy of men is hunger. Where there is hunger, there can be no peace. The greatest enemy of man is hunger. The IGC could establish directives for the survival of mankind. This is 1965. Today is 2025. We are looking at the same problems. This organization can still today be a major player in establishing these directives for the survival of mankind on this planet. 1974, and it went to Russia. Those of you as old as I am, and I hope there are not many of you out there that are, but uh, that was at the height of the Cold War. There was a lot of concern in the world. And here we have Dmitry Polyansky from Russia in 1974 telling the delegates at that Congress you are engaged in the problems of grasslands. They are organically linked with the cause of peace. We went to Canada in 1997. Bart Christie reminds us that without grasslands, the breadbaskets of today can become and will become the dust bowls of tomorrow. We are now getting more and more good research done showing just why, and the producers talked about that this morning, why you get that benefit of inclusion of grasslands in that rotation with, with cropping systems and why that improves soil health and why you get an environmental benefit. We're now documenting what they already knew. In Sao Paulo, Brazil, our second trip to Brazil in uh, 2001, John Hodgson, known all over the world for his research in grasslands, says that there can be no doubt the continuing importance of grasslands to food production and environmental stability. Environment has now come into the dialogue and is equally prevalent and growing in its importance every, every day that goes by. Jim, we went to Hohat. We took the Grasslands Congress and the Rangelands Congress and we met in Hohat, China in 2008 and it was an incredible opportunity for all of us. And he was president of the continuing committee of the IRC at the time. And he stood there and told the members that were present at that Congress, from the earliest of beginnings, our global grazing lands have been essential to human survival. I would submit to you that that statement is even more true now than it was then, Jim. Human survival, grasslands, they go together. Went to Sydney, Australia in 2013, and the uh, David Kemp and David, Mil I'm not sure I can pronounce his name, Milchek, 
uh, were present, the co-presidents of that, and they stated in their uh, remarks that the future of humankind depends deeply on understanding, managing, and sustaining grasslands. There's the map from the beginning in Leipzig up until the uh, Congress is uh, where the book was published and today, it, it's up to date today. So you can see where it's been. You've seen the cluster of them. There, there were many of the first meetings in Europe for obvious reasons, but it's now been in every single region defined by the International Grasslands Congress in the world. 24 Congresses are in that book. They go from Leipzig, Germany to New Delhi, India, and that's where the book is published. And we were delighted to get it published. We were glad to have that uh, completed. It left us with uh, pleasure in that, but a problem. Because history doesn't stand still, it keeps going. Since then, we had the Congress in Kenya. We are standing here today in Covington, Kentucky, and those need to be written and put into the history book as well. You can't unpublish a book, and we didn't want to try. But what we did do is to create an annex, a place to house things, a place to keep things so that you don't lose them. So what we'll do now, going into the future, is for each Congress, we will write that history just as we did for each Congress in the book, but it will be put into an annex to that history, and it can go on as long as there are Congresses to, to go to. So uh, that's where you will find the Congress is going into the future. And of course, the first one is Kenya, and it is already written, and it's already in that annex. And now there will shortly be Kentucky to join that. Incidentally, uh, Kenya, as you know, is the first of our virtual Congresses. Uh, it is a first. And again, I congratulate the Kenyans and the leadership of both the IRC and the IGC for what it took to bring that uh, Congress to a very successful conclusion. I think the technologies that we saw there are going to be more and more part of everything we do going forward. I saved Ray Brome for last. Ray Brome was chair at uh, the Congress that spanned two, two countries, Australia and New Zealand, in 1993. And at the close of that conference, Ray knew that everybody that came had been exposed to an enormous amount of information. And at the closing ceremony, he stated, it's now up to you to provide your recommendations and your conclusions. Make them good. Perhaps the world has not got much time left and to ensure the sustainability of its grasslands. His message is very, very much on point today. Since that time, we have seen many more challenges. We talked about, the, we listened to the producers this morning, the loss of our grasslands is horrifying. It is the basis of every message that came through this Congress from its beginning. National security, food security, grasslands. We cannot let them go. Final thoughts, in that first Congress in Leipzig, Germany, there was a sense of urgency. They had just been dealing with, with uh, the problems that would lead to hunger and all kinds of to wars and everything else. And they, they knew the role grasslands could play, and they knew they had to get them going as a part of the whole agricultural picture. The second thought I would leave you with is that one person can make a difference. Don't ever feel like that it can't be done because there's nobody else to help. And, and you can make a difference. Everyone in this room has made a difference. And one person can make a difference. But think of the difference that can be made with all of the one persons that are in the International Grasslands Congress and the International Rangeland Congress the European Grassland Federation, the new organization out of Kenya, and the list goes on and on. We have an enormous voice. In the Congress in Brazil, John Hodgson was asked about a role of advocacy for the Congress, and he told that group, the IGC has never played a role of ad advocacy. But if we don't do it, who does? 
we are the people that do know what the need is, what the opportunities are, and what the tragedy will be if nothing's done. So I repeat those words today. If we don't do it, who does? I appreciate your being here. I appreciate your listening. Take home with you the information that you have received here at this Congress and the urgency of the need to do something about our future. I thank you very much. Thank you, Vivian. That was a wonderful presentation, a wonderful reminder. And as Vivian said, one person can make a difference. And Vivian's an example of a one person making a difference in different fields and different areas and different institutions, and now taking on the challenge of the lead role, particularly she and Roger, with writing this history and giving us, you know, show, I mean, we had a rich legacy, but a lot of us didn't even know about it, didn't know the details of it. And so bringing that to light, thank you. Um, the annex to the history, we had photocopies here um, that will soon be available on the website as a PDF um, for you to download. Um, but we, we had that almost completed, so I went ahead and made photocopies to have, have here available at the meeting. <clears throat> So now is our time to formally look forward to the next IGC in 2027 in Leipzig, Germany. So we're going to ask members of the organizing committee for that Congress. First of all, thank them for their interest, for putting in a bid, for then modifying that bid um, that, we, that we were glad to accept and taking on the challenge and the opportunity for the next IGC. So, welcome to the stage. Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, at the end of the 25th International Grassland Congress, Joanna and me, on behalf of the German Thunen Institute, the Julius Kühn Institute, and the Center for Agricultural Landscape Research as the organizers, we invite you all to join the next the 26th International Grassland Congress to be held in Leipzig in June. 2027. The motto of the Congress will be 100 years of grassland research, ways to the future. Since we have Vivian Allen's really interesting book and a presentation right now, there is uh, no need to report at large about the history of the Grassland Congress at the moment, though 100 years is part of the motto but only a very few words. The 26th Congress will take place exactly 100 years after the first multinational meeting of pasture and meadow agriculturists from North and Central European countries was organized in Leipzig. In his authorized capacity as chairman of the crop production department of the German Agricultural Society, Professor Friedrich Falke, gave the invitation to come to Leipzig University in spring 1927. It's a great honor for me to announce the next important grassland science event at this place, to this auditory, at the end of my scientific career. After a terrible world war, European and German division, German reunion in between, we personally also had to look for a way to Professor Falke. 
Oh, sorry. To Professor Falke. It became a real pleasure for me because Friedrich Falke was born and grew up in the village Schwarzholz. You can see it on the, on the first picture there. Only 29 miles from the region where I was born and lived there until now. Two years ago, we celebrated Falke's 150th birthday at Eden Research Station close to Schwarzholz, together with active grassland researchers, advisors, and farmers from all over Germany and with the members of the Falke family. I tried to help you a little bit, but. No? No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> Although Falke was the initiator, he was only one of the group of four, consisting of Anders Elofsson from Sweden, Albert Volkart from Switzerland, and Karl Schneider Kleberg from Germany. Vivian has just described this very well. They four were on the opinion that an increasing intensity of the use of pastures and meadows in a farm leads to more cheap farm-based forage and less important expensive feed, and better management and higher fertility of all farm soils. Second, that there is a gap of management intensity and scientific knowledge and standards between production on arable land and on pastures and meadows out of all reason. And third, that this gap can easier be closed when researchers and advisors working on similar research standards, pool their capacities, match their methods, and share their results. We, as the organizers of the next conference, are in the opinion that this all is very, very relevant also today. Before Joanna will tell you something about the new Congress itself, a few words on that, what you will find in terms of grassland and forage when you come to the Congress, to Germany, in, 19, in 2027. Today, after one or two weeks, particularly the attendants from Europe are still deeply impressed by the tremendous dimensions in grassland farming they saw in Kentucky, in Indiana, and other places in the US during the tours. Thank you very much, Ray, for giving us that opportunity. When you come to Central Europe, to Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, the dimensions are somewhat lowlier, perhaps higher concentrated, on relatively small area of land and at low distances in between, we can offer grassland and forage under Atlantic, rather continental, and alpine conditions, as well as in the uplands, in between. Except for a very few counties of very high soil quality, grassland is distributed all over the states with a certain stress on the alpine region, the coast, and the uplands. On about 20 million hectares of agricultural land, we have almost 15 million head of cattle out of this 5 million milking cows, more than 2 million sheep, and more than 1 million horses. Additionally, more than 10,000 biogas plants produce electricity, heat, or gas based on slurry or crop material. Grassland is used mainly for cattle husbandry, as the high number of holdings show. Sheep husbandry, mainly for meat and for landscape maintenance on drier sites in the uplands and on dikes. Grassland used by horses keeping in the vicinity of bigger cities and by wild animal husbandry is slowly but steadily growing. Biogas production from slurry, maize and also grass you will find all over the country when you go there. 
One word more for cattle. Cattle husbandry means milk production, mainly with Holstein Frisians, grazing or kept in barns all over the country, but in particular in the Atlantic north of Germany and in the Alps. Cattle husbandry for meat production with suckler cows of very different breeds kept outdoors throughout the year is everywhere in the country, but in particular in the continental northeast in holdings up to several hundred suckler cows and in the uplands in holdings of very different size depending on the region. The three countries you will visit during the Congress and the tours have a relatively dense net of universities, federal research institutions, and state research and advisory organizations where grassland and forage is an important topic. Researchers and advisors and also farm farmers cooperate in sections of the German Plant Science Society and its Association for Grassland and Forage, in the communities, in the, for, in the committees, sorry, for grassland and forage, and forage conservation of the German Agricultural Society and in the grassland associations of Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. Last but not least, intensive cooperation between scientific institutions, farms, and the industry is also characteristic for grassland and forage research and development in Germany. All this you will meet when you come to the next Congress. Joanna, please continue. Thanks a lot, Jürgen. Yeah, as Jürgen already stated, uh, and we already heard uh, in a wonderful presentation before, is that the first International Grassland Congress was in 1927 in Leipzig, and the 50-year anniversary was in Leipzig as well in 1977. And I would like to take uh, this moment also to say thank you to Jürgen to be my companion and guide into the community of the IGC because I'm pretty new to it. But I'm super happy and excited uh, to present you the fact that we will have the IGC in 2027, which is the 100 year anniversary in Leipzig again to go full circle in that history. And uh, we will have it as you already heard under the title of 100 years of grassland research, ways to the future. The exact date is 13th to 18th of June, so please all mark your calendars because I would be super happy to see a lot of the faces. I think we already made some friends here in the room over the last week and it would be amazing to welcome you all to Leipzig and to Germany. So what, will you, what do you have to expect from that location that we want to invite you to? So Leipzig is a city in the central east lowlands of Germany. And uh, the venue that we will stay at is the famous Leipzig Congress Hall, and it is the exact same place that the 50-year anniversary was held as well. The place for the first Congress is not, um, not there anymore, uh, so the house is not present anymore, but we will be in the same house than the 50 ones. And to give you an impression of uh, where we will uh, guide you to, so this house was built in 1900, and uh, it was destroyed by a large part in the Second World War, but restored afterwards. And it has been modified also uh, with new rooms, with, uh, with um, new architecture and technique, and uh, is, I think, a very condign venue to celebrate a 100 years anniversary. And the Congress itself, uh, we hope to get the possibility to, uh, to talk and discuss with all of you about efficient grassland management for healthy food, renewable resource for bioenergy, mitigation of climate change, preservation of biodiversity and ecosystem services, and also improvement of, of agricultural landscapes. And we already clustered, and this is what you see here in this icon, uh, the Congress and also three different uh, important topics, which is the rethinking of our agricultural landscapes, the implementation of all the novel techniques that we work on, and also together facing the future challenges. And we want to do this in uh, about 40 sessions that we are currently planning in four different themes, which you can see here, grassland production and utilization, efficient grassland-based livestock production systems, grassland ecosystem services, and grassland policies initiative, and also social issues. And we're also planning on a bunch of workshops and masterclasses 
and uh, evening events to get us all together because we think that's also the value of such an International Grassland Congress to be together, to meet and to talk and exchange different views and also to promote young scientists. We, uh, we hope to also get them going and get the community uh, together. So that is something uh, we hope for to also pave the way for the next 100 years of IGC. Of course, we are planning on mid-Congress tours, and we have seen uh, amazing examples here during this Congress. Thanks again to the organizing team of, the, of this current Congress. And uh, so we will be for the, for the mid-Congress tours in the area around Leipzig. And what you will see is um, fen grasslands, pasture management, livestock husbandry, and arable fodder production in about eight mid-Congress tours. And we will see this on grassland farms, but also on experimental stations and infrastructures of several universities and state and research institutes that are all aligned here. Of course, we also want to do post and or pre-Congress tours. And all these Congress tours um, will be in Germany or the surrounding countries, because as you know, Germany is pretty small as compared to the US where we are currently. So we will also take some of the of our um, southern uh, countries uh, into these uh, tours. And all the tours uh, will focus on um, getting some information to you about the farming practices in the areas, about research and advisory, but also about culture and heritage of the region. The first tour will be in the northwestern part, close to the North Sea, and you will see um, the area around the cities of Hamburg, Bremen, and Oldenburg. This is, uh, this is characterized by a maritime climate and uh, that comes from the North Sea and some small to medium-sized farms and pretty intensive management systems. The second tour will be in the northeastern part and uh, range between the capital Berlin and uh, the coast of the Baltic Sea. And you will also see fence, uh, but larger farms and intensive and extensive management of these grasslands. The third tour will uh, lead you to the central part of Germany, to the central uplands and alp foothills and hilly areas of this region. And you will see a lot of variation there from small to very big livestock holdings and intensive to extensive grasslands. As I already said, we will also extend this to our southern partner countries um, that we uh, share the wonderful Alp region with. And both tours that go uh, towards the south will uh, lead you to the typical alpine grasslands with intensive management in, uh, uh, in the valleys and extensive management on the, on the alpine upper parts. And the tour to Switzerland will lead you around Zurich and Bern, but also Stuttgart and the Swabian Alp in Germany. And the Austrian tour will bring you in the area of the Bavarian Alps, uh, up to, uh, down to Salzburg, and also the Austrian Alpine region. So until now, this is four years uh, ahead. So it's quite a, quite a long time. But as you see, there's already quite some planning. We already have the venue, and there is a lot of thinking going into this. But uh, to keep you posted, we already set up a, a preliminary homepage that is currently based uh, under the domain of ZALF. But please keep in mind that this is a, a collaborative effort together with JKI and Tunin Institute. So currently, you can find it with this uh, um, QR code, or if you go on the web page of ZALF, you will find the information. You will also, in, in a few days or weeks, find the information via the official IGC web page. And if you want to be informed during the time until the next Congress, you can also sign up to our IGC mailing list with this um, email and we will also put some printouts on this very first table here if you want to have them after our talk and get some more information for those who didn't already take them at our booth in the um, exhibitor store. And with that, all that remains to be said is that we are exciting, excited to do so and we are looking forward to see a lot of these faces that we got to know here and we hope you will all make it in four years to Germany and to Leipzig. Thanks a lot.